David Edward and Mark Salter discuss Mark's new book, Sins of the Tribe. Mark, how are you? Good, Dave. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing really good. You know, Mark, it's really fun and exciting for me to get to talk to someone who actually went to a pro football camp. Yeah, many, (laughs) many years ago. Yeah, I was signed out of, uh, I played football at Canisius College, small football, and then got signed uh, by the New York Giants and uh, played through the preseason, played in all the preseason games, and then um, then I was released. But uh, it was a lot of fun, and it was against all the big name players like Lawrence Taylor and wow. Harry Carsons and Jim Burt. So it was it was a great experience. And who was the coach then? Uh, Bill Parcells. Bill Parcells. You know, now you've written a book um, that that is, is about college football, not professional football. But you know, it might be a good idea to get someone like Bill Parcells to maybe read the book and see if he likes it. Bill, in fact, was uh, did read it and absolutely loved it. He, um, in his, as a matter of fact, he's an endorser for the book. And when he and I last met, uh, he said, "You know, I really loved your book, and there's a lot of crazy things that, that happen in the book. I mean, shocking things." And he's he's seen it all. But he said football's been very good to him. And so uh, I said, "Well, let me paraphrase. Let's let's talk about what what your reaction was." And he came up with a quote, uh, I found sins of the tribe to be very troubling, but it was too stimulating to put down. And we really <laughs> like that. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, the new, you know, Bill Parcells, I have to admit, I am a fan of a different team in that division. Um, so the only time I would ever root for the Giants is when they were playing the Cowboys or the Eagles. You can figure the rest out. I can uh, figure the rest <laughs> out. And you're okay with that new name? You know what? Um, <laughs> we don't have time. Uh, to go over my feelings about the entire uh, the At entire least situation. it's not the old name. At least it's not the old name. Uh, so much has come out about the, the the goofiness that that particular team was doing behind the scenes in the past, you know, decade. And I haven't been a huge fan the past decade. I I, I, I moved to Florida, so I'm a, I've switched my allegiance to one of the Florida teams. Okay. Um, but yeah, when when at the time period you're talking about, they were a class act. I mean, you know, they were. Yeah, it was it was all great. They so were. so so Mark, let's get into this. So this is. This is the first book that you've had published. You, you've been writing for a very long time. Yes. Uh, but, but what is this book, Sins of the Tribe? What is it about? Sins of the Tribe. Uh, Sins of the Tribe is a literary novel that explores the impact of intense tribalism and its resulting dehumanization in a setting that's popular, wildly flawed, and hiding in plain sight, college football. The overall theme, I guess, would be uh, morality is uh, subordinate to tribalism. Interesting. I like you that. Want, okay, you, want I, tell you, you want me to tell you a little bit more about the, yeah, the actual book? Yeah, sure. So the book centers around two brothers, Wally and Henry. Wally, they're both of the same age. Wally is adopted. Uh, Henry is special needs. And they live under the abuse of their alcoholic uh, father. Uh, all Wally really dreams about is escaping that, that home life. Uh, he even has a pipe dream uh, to somehow attend and maybe and he, he couldn't imagine ever playing for them, but playing for uh, the Bastille University tribe. Uh, Bastille University is this incredible academic institution, and it also has this fantastic football team. They've won six national champions under the uh, leadership of Coach John Oldham, who's the saintly and revered figure, like one, one, the most popular coach in all uh, the most popular college coach in the entire land. He's just completely iconic. So, but Wally knows he is not good enough uh, to even be a walk-on because he's a high school quarterback. But Henry uh, is a savant of a kicker. He is unbelievable. Um, Given that he's special needs, he does not get, um, uh, he does not get nervous. Uh, Nothing rattles him. And he's the most unbelievable kicker in the world. And through a little bit of luck and a whole lot of struggle, Wally gets him in front of a Bastille, co- uh, Bastille scout. So the scout is impressed enough. And next thing you know, the, the next year, they're on the team. And Wally just has this incredibly fantastic experience uh, during that first season. Uh, but what he also notices is the just enormous pressure that these players have to live under and the coaches. But Coach Oldham is such a uh, revered leader. He has he can wield the power to, to, to keep the, the um, these corrosive pressures off. 
until there's a major, major change in the program and that power suddenly disappears. And what happens then is the culture changes overnight and uh, it, it gets, um, as one reviewer put it, uh, from there on, things get shocking. Uh, <laughs> Wally and Henry find themselves in the middle of a scandal, not of their making. And next thing you know, Wally's got to figure out, do I, do I adhere to the principles that, uh, that I worship from afar? Or, uh, and, but if I do, we're going to pay the price. Mm-hmm. And that, it goes from there. Wow. So, I mean, is, is, is how fictional is this book? You know, I had a, uh, there's a friend of mine. Um, his name's Bill Ard. Uh, he, I met him when I was my brief time with the Giants. And he and I really hit it off. He played for about 11 years in the NFL, won a Super Bowl, and uh, had a great career. I'm, I'm jealous of the guy. Um, <laughs> I wasn't nearly as good Don't as be him. jealous. Oh, You've God. done fine. <laughs> um, no, he's a great guy. And he also read it and he said, everything that you have in there has happened a hundred, hundreds of times. Mm. And there's some pretty brutal stuff that goes on. Um, and the whole reason why we want tribal dominance. That's all we care about. Yeah. Interesting. So, so how do you get into the headspace to, to, to tackle, you know, a subject, I mean, fictionalized, but you know, in some ways the fact is fictionalized is worse because you have to, in your head, think, you know, invent, all of these horrible things that are going to happen. And you have to also be the character that they happen to, right? Cause you, you got to do both sides of that. So, so h- how did you pick this topic and, and what was that process like to, to, to actually write this book? You know, the, first and foremost, I love football, love college football. And there's a lot of great programs that are out there where the coaches are really good people. Um, so this is not to, uh, this is not meant to be some kind of, uh, expose on, on a topic. There's also a lot of bad situations out there. And so, uh, I really profiled both and how did I get there? First of all, you'd see these things that happen and you want to start to ask why. And the deeper I probed, uh, I came to the conclusion that that this is just another form of tribalism. That's very important to people. As a matter of fact, in the book, there's uh, one of uh, one of the characters, the professor, explains tribalism to Wally, mm. and he says, "You know, this stuff is real. You'll get. There's no other place where you're going to get this feeling where you can, you know, throw on the team colors, show up to the stadium, be accepted upon sight. Uh, you know, most of us spend our days staring at a spreadsheet, and you know, there is no outlet for victory, and we really need to have that. So that's." To me, that's where a lot of it is driven from. It's just th- this need to be part of the, this uh, uh, the, the, the celebratory tribal setting. It it sounds a lot like um, a, a simile or a metaphor or allegory, whatever you want to call it, for other things that go on in our lives today, culturally and stuff. Yes, a lot of reviewers have said that, in as much as this is, it's there are parts where it's heavy on football. They said you. you don't need to be a football fan or to even understand the game in order to really enjoy this book because it does resonate with some of the larger things that are going on in our country today yeah and i take it so far as to say that to me everything is tribal um morality we all like to dress ourselves up and then say that our tribe is moral what we really want is a dominant tribe you can see that in politics you can see that in business religions everything uh, empties out into that well, and one of the categories this book is doing well, and it's doing it's doing pretty good. It's it's only been out for three weeks, but the the uh, sociology of sports. Yes, is, is yeah, I, I noticed that. Yeah, I loved so it. That, that that that's fascinating, and I I think there's a lot. I mean, I I have my own you know philosophies that I've I've developed, um, and some of them I, I at some point maybe we'll have a different conversation, um, and we can talk deeper into some of those themes because it really sounds like like a fascinating way to explore some of the themes that we all deal with because to your point, we're not, and we're not just in one tribe, we're in many tribes. Um, but it's a way to do it against a subject that while it's tough for the characters in the book, for sure. And, and we have empathy with them. We aren't all football players, so we don't all have to see ourselves or, or pick. We don't come into it with a side pick necessarily. I'm sure there's a morality that, mm-hmm. that we get from the book, um, but it's a way to examine it. You know, that's safe, I guess, for a lot of the readers. So I think that's really a fascinating way to do it. 
Right, I agree. Yeah. So, so what was what would, what the, what was your process to write this? I mean, did you outline it? Did you lock yourself in a room and write five hundred words a day, or how long did it take to write the book, and, and how do you go about it? So, as I mentioned before, this is my third one, the first to get published, and I do have an approach to it. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of the the really important themes and ideas are just developed in my head. Um, it, it's almost like a, a, the ideas are percolating and the ones that are really good stick. And it can be a scene, it can be a dynamic, it can be an emotion. Uh, but And then next thing you know, I've kind of got this story laid out in my head. I purposely do not outline it at all to start with. Later on, I do. And I write... Uh, I just start writing. As soon as I get that opening scene, and to me, that might have been one of the hardest things. Mm -hmm. And the opening scene in, in Sins has been called, uh, it's a little bit bizarre. Um, so I get the opening scene, and uh, I let it go from there, and I let my characters develop. And it's funny, when you get into it, you, you have a feeling about what the character is going to be. But until you start actually writing uh, you know, you, you kind of surprise yourself as to where the, the, the characters go. So I write, write about half the book, knowing that I've got some things that are going, uh, you know, some storylines that aren't really working or, you know, I know it's a little bit messy. And I get about halfway through until I really, really know and understand all the characters. Then I put down uh, the Word document and I pick up a spreadsheet. And down one, uh, the first column is every scene that I've come up with. And across the top row is every character and every theme in the book. Um, and then from there, I have a certain structure that I use and I color code it so I can see how, how it all meshes together. And that's also where I find the holes in the plot. And so after ruminating over that for, for as long as it takes, yeah. I get it to where now you got a story and I go back to the very beginning and then i rewrite it um using the guide that i put together and wow. then when you get to the end uh you know you got a book but it's first draft and the one thing i've learned about writing all writing is bad until it isn't yeah that is so <laughs> yeah your process is similar to mine my, my books i tend to shoot for about sixty thousand words on my books so they're short you know they're not huge books but it's almost exactly what you described for me the first ten thousand words are excruciatingly difficult um the third 10,000 words leading to the half of the book are, are even are 10 times more difficult. But then once I hit half, it's exactly what you said. I now I understand the characters. I understand their journey. I understand the themes and the plot. And I know where it's going. So now it's, it's all downhill, if you will. Right. Um, I, I'm not organized enough to uh, create a spreadsheet like you do though. That's, that's very impressive. That, so your stories are probably, your story is probably a lot tighter than my stuff. <laughs> so how many words count do you usually shoot for? About 60,000. Okay. In my limit, the thrillers, which is that's about the typical um, size of a thriller. Okay, yeah, this one's long. This is one hundred and twenty-five thousand, or that's actually a, no, one hundred uh, one hundred and twenty-eight thousand. That's a big book. Yeah, that that's a big book. Um, uh, now that is that that's a big book for almost any kind of book. So, uh, but you know, you're, you're tackling some some big themes, and you're having to set up a world that a lot of us aren't going to be familiar with. So, I guess it probably takes a lot of extra work. Um, uh, to do that yeah it was at one point it was 150,000 words that's a lot of words <laughs> yeah and I knew I had to tone it back and... that's not a book anymore that's something else 150 that's that's two or three books honestly so two books anyway yeah yeah interesting well you know the book's been out for about three weeks is that right came out um July, July 12th 12th and it's doing pretty good yeah. I think out there and it's getting pretty well received and the hardcover is selling just as much as the um, the digital version, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. This has been just a, you know, writing is such a passionate uh, thing to do. Uh, and at one point I was, I resigned myself to the fact that even if you don't get published, you need to get this thing done. Mm. So to have it published and uh, uh, to be received well, it's, it's really is exciting. It, it is. So, so is this is, and we talked earlier, I mean, so this is the, your third book, but it's the first one that, that has made it to the, sh the bookshelves, I guess we would mm -hmm. say. Um, is there anything that surprised you about um, the book actually coming out? Any of the feedback you got, positive or negative? I mean, and, and, you know, and anything about this topic? Has anyone contacted you, you know, specifically relating to some of the subject matter that you cover? Uh, I'm starting to get some people reaching out to me now. Uh, the most in 
you know, when I wrote this and I got it done and I, and you know how it is, you go back and you reread it and you reread it. And at one point it was, yes, this is the book that I wanted to write. Even in comparison to when I first started, uh, to me, it turned out better than what I had in my own mind. Um, the thing that surprised me is, is that I, you know, the, it was the book that turned that I wanted. There's a lot of people out there that just really dig this book. Yeah. I've had um, a handful of people, uh, people that I don't know, that have gotten it and couldn't put it down and read it in one sitting over 10 hours. Wow. Um, and, I, one, and, your point, and this, this is a big book to do that with. This is not, this is not some dime store, you know, pulp novel. Yeah. There was one woman who said that um, she had been meaning to read it. And this is before it got published. It was a friend of a friend of a friend that was tangentially associated with uh, the publishing business. And um, she got it and she had it for about a month. Uh, her husband and son were going away on a trip. So she started on a Friday night at about eight o'clock and just kept reading and uh, went through. She said, I think she finished at seven o'clock the next morning. <laughs> it was mad at me because I stole her night of sleep, I guess. That's well, you know what, though? Time well spent, I'm sure. So so what advice do you have for someone who, um, uh, you know, wants to because wants to capture part of their life experience and their life journey. And that's what I did in my books. You know, I rely heavily on things that I'm not in the book, but, but those experiences are, um, what, what advice would you have for someone who, who, who thinks they have a book in their head and they kind of want to get it out there into the world? Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> yeah, don't the only do way, money, right? <laughs> the only way that you should ever write is if you can't not write, if you have to write. Um, to me, and that, so I'm being a little bit silly. Mm -hmm. Writing is just such a fantastic way of uh, expressing yourself. Um, so what advice would I give them? It's be patient with it. Uh, make sure you read, you know, the books on writing, show, don't tell, you know, read, make sure your grammar is solid. Um, I, I've got a whole bunch of little rules that have accumulated in my head over the years. I won't bore you with them now. Um, but it, it's a passion project and you have to really apply yourself and be patient with yourself because it is going to take a long time. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I tell people don't, don't start a book. You're not going to finish. If, if you want to be a writer, pick, pick something. Well, that's that a really good, finish. that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, but it's like you said, I, I when I started doing this, I started doing it during the pandemic. Cause I, what, else, what the hell else was I going to do? I was tired mm -hmm. of watching TV. Um, but now I can't not write. I, I've tried when I finish a book, I try and take like a week off. I can I can't do it. It's just become part of me. Um, and I, I think and it's good and bad. It's like any other addiction. Um, but at least this prediction produces content. <laughs> so, right. You know, so it's good that way. All right, Mark. Well, look, I hope you have tremendous success with this book. Um, and uh, I hope you write many, many more. I know you told me you were working on um, another one, not a sequel, uh, but another book. Um, and I hope, uh, how far along are you on your, on, on that next book? Yeah, it's written. I have taken a little bit of time off and I, I need to go back and see it, same thing. I need to go back and look for parts where it just feels like it could be better. You know, that, that's other good advice though, right? If you write something, sometimes you have to truly step away from it for a while and then come back to it before you can look at it objectively. So I think that's probably another good yeah, and in my own head, it's all writing is bad until it isn't. You know, I know, and that that's a, that is a truism beyond truisms. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, look, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, if you can go back in time and make the Giants, let me know. I'll buy your <laughs> card, <laughs> and I'll, I'll and I and I will root for that team uh, in the past in ways I didn't when it was the present. How's that? <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, by the time you get done uh, reading the book, you're going to be a huge Bastille fan. Okay, if, I, you know what? Um, I'm I'm close to some programs that uh, are not quite as storied as that program is presented, but they're not too bad. I, I live between Gainesville and Tallahassee, so uh, we we know it down here. We know the we know. Oh the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you for watching. Please consider hitting the subscribe button.